Welcome everyone who's tuning in to this evening's Crow Canyon webinar entitled Revisiting Chaco Morphology and Meaning with Sean Field. Uh, really excited about this webinar uh, tonight. My name is Mark Varian. I'm one of the archaeologists at the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Um, in fact, the longest tenured employee at Crow Canyon. I started at the center in 1987. Um, We'll go through a few logistics about the webinar tonight. Um, you should see a screen that will have Sean's PowerPoint on the left and then his head on the right. You can pull that vertical line over to minimize Sean's the size of Sean and maximize the size of the images that he's showing. And um, you can even move it and get it out of the way. There is a live transcription that I think you can see now that has worked really well. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the uh, talk, and the best way to get those questions in is through the Q&A that uh, is on the bar for the Zoom meetings. Uh, there's also a chat bar and somebody will monitor those, but the Q&A is the best way to submit your questions. If you're having any difficulties with the Zoom meeting, head over to crowcanion.org backslash Facebook, and this is streaming on that site too. The um, Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and there's often parts of the talk that you may want to go back and visit, or if you have to leave the talk earlier, it will be published probably tomorrow. Taylor will do that on Crow Canyon's YouTube site. So you go to crowcanyon.org YouTube, there's a button that says videos, and then all of our webinars are there. So it's a, a really good resource. Crow Canyon's mission is to empower present and future generations by making the past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. We're extremely committed to that uh, mission. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo Ute, Paiute, Diné, Navajo, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission-related work just wouldn't be possible without uh, indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Sarah, do you want to talk, talk about this slide? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Payne. I'm the Chief Outreach Officer at Crow Canyon, and I'm here with Piki the Pack Rat, who's my trusty sidekick. Those of you who know me know that Piki goes with me everywhere on our explorations and adventures. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our new challenge match. We've had such tremendous success in connecting people from all over the world with our webinar series that a loyal board member of ours has put forth a $50,000 challenge match. So you can double your impact and uh, help us with our goal to reach that $50,000 uh, goal, which is if you look at the slide here, we have already achieved 20% seven percent of that goal and it's all because of you you are such a, a powerful motivator and inspiration for us in the work that we do and we are ever grateful for your many contributions to our organization there are a few different ways that you can donate Taylor is going to put a link to the donation uh, portal in the zoom and facebook feeds uh, so you can click the link there. You can also donate securely online at our website, which is crowcanyon.org. And if you prefer to mail a check, just make sure that you notate your check as going to the webinar challenge match, and we'll be sure to get that counted. So thank you again for uh, sticking with us through this wild ride. We are so grateful to connect with you in this new digital world. So back to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, the webinars are every Thursday, and the next two are going to be very exciting. 
Uh, next Thursday will be a webinar entitled Mimbres, the view from West Mexico, Azatlan cargo systems and figurative bowl traditions by Dr. Michael Mathiewicz. Uh, Michael gave a webinar about a month ago, and it's safe to say, I think that he has the most encyclopedic knowledge of anyone about West Mexico archeology span and the connections between that archeology span and the archeology span in the Southwestern United States. His webinar two weeks ago was just, I learned so much from it. So you'll want to tune into that one. Then two Thursdays from now is our, uh, colleague and research associate at Crow Canyon, uh, Dr. Lori Webster, who will be jo joined by Diana Barg, and they'll be presenting a webinar called Perishable Artifacts in the Bureau of Land Management uh, Cerberus Collection. Uh, so that is a collection that um, came from uh, artifacts that were recovered from a variety of people. And if you know Lori's work, these perishable collections are some of the most jaw-dropping artifacts from the past that you'll ever see. And they provide just whole new insights into the uh, cultures that we're studying. So that too will be a, a really great um, webinar. We like to post this slide, the various indigenous groups uh, in the four corners that we mentioned earlier, um, are all hit hard, as all of us are, by uh, COVID, but there are several places that you can donate to to help those communities. The Pueblo Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopley Families COVID Relief Fund, and the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund. So this is a good slide that if you don't have something to write these down with, that you can go back to this presentation uh, on the YouTube channel and get these links and make those donations to help out these communities as they make it through this difficult and challenging time. Well, that brings us to uh, tonight's talk, Revisiting Chaco Road Morphology and Meaning. Um, there are few artifacts that are more important in understanding the Chaco political system, how it was organized, and the political complexity and social complexity that goes along with Chaco, then the system of roads. Uh, Sean Field is presenting tonight, and he began his research on uh, Chaco and roads when he was doing his master's research at the University of Nebraska Lincoln with the prominent Chaco and archaeologist Carrie Heitman. Uh, and he is continuing that research as he's working on his PhD with uh, Donna Glowacki, former Crow Canyon intern, Crow Canyon employee, and distinguished professor at Notre Dame University, uh, who's, and she's the chair of uh, Sean's dissertation research. Um, Sean got his BA from the University of Northern Colorado and grew up um, in a sort of ranching family uh, and a scholarly family in Colorado. He's done field work in Greece and Ireland, as well as the Southwest US, where his work is focused on uh, Mesa Verde. And I've been lucky enough to work with Sean, uh, documenting some of the largest and longest lived sites uh, on the Mesa Verde escarpment. And I can assure you that Sean's skills as an archeologist, especially using the most recent cutting edge technology for recording sites, far surpasses mine. So I'm really excited to uh, hear about his ongoing research on Chaco Roads. So I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Sean. All right, well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, hopefully my screen is up and everyone can see that. Um, if not, um, someone can tell me. <laughs> we'll start see over. All good? Yep, we can see it perfect. Awesome, thank you. Well, yeah, thanks again, Mark. Uh, yeah, that was a great introduction. Um, hopefully I can live up to a little bit of that in this talk. Also, thanks uh, to Sarah and Taylor and Crow Canyon for giving me the opportunity. Um, to, to chat and share some of the things that I've been thinking about and doing this past year. 
Um, to give you just a little bit of context, a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about today um, has essentially come out of having to sit in front of my computer for a year and not being able to do a ton of field work. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to, uh, to, to examine some of these findings or conclusions on the ground or to, to grapple with them in certain ways that you can when you're in the field. Um, but hopefully they'll still be interesting enough for us to, uh, to think about for, it, for a little bit of time this evening. Um, yeah, so I'll dive right in. The talk's called Revisiting Chocolate Road Morphology and Meaning. Uh, and a little bit of that is just a nod to a ton of other archaeologists and people who have, who have spent a lot of time thinking about roads. Um, and so hopefully uh, we can talk about some things uh, that others have talked about um, and then maybe have something new to say as well. Um, and one of the people that's recently spent a lot of time, at least in this younger generation archaeologists, um, that's focusing on Chaco Roads is Rob Weiner, who's a grad student out of CU. Um, and he gave a talk last August on Chaco Roads. So if you haven't um, seen that talk, I'd recommend going, searching that, and looking it up. Uh, it's really good work. And um, he's, he talked a lot of, about a lot of stuff that I may not be able to get to today. Um, so hopefully this, um, if, if things, if you have any lingering questions, you might be able to go there and find, find some answers uh, through a digital format. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is to just give you a, a roadmap, uh, pun definitely intended, um, to, of what I'm gonna talk about today um, and, and where we're gonna be going. Uh, so I'll start off with a relatively brief introduction about Chaco Roads. And Mark did a great job of, of kind of contextualizing why it's important to talk about and study roads um, as a way to talk about the, the system centered around Chaco Canyon more broadly. Um, and one of the ways that we can study the roads is looking at the morphology of these features. Uh, so I'll talk about that, why it's important, um, and then detail one of the ways that we can study morphology using remotely sensed data, primarily LIDAR. Um, I'll then go through some of the outcomes for some uh, analyses that I've done using LIDAR to talk about um, this idea that there is a formal type of Chaco road that has a really uh, common form of uh, physical characteristic, and then um, other roads that don't really seem to, to fit that description, right, which kind of begs the question or begins to imply uh, that, you know, not all Chaco roads are, are built the same. Right. And so using that understanding of Chaco Roads, I'll switch gears at the end uh, to talk about one of the, the many possible uses um, of Chaco Roads and, and how we can begin to talk about labor relationships and networks across the Chaco world by looking at roads and the utility of roads. Um, so moving on in, uh, Chaco Roads are, as a lot of archaeologists have pretty concisely put it, uh, wide, straight, long earthen depressions. Uh, and they're similar to roads across uh, modern and uh, ancestral times in the sense that they're a uh, physical representation or footprint of connections between people and places, right? So roads are important uh, largely to the degree that they're physically connecting things. And, and we get an idea about what was intentionally meant to be connected and perhaps places that may not have been. Um, something that's interesting about the Chaco Roads um, that began to appear in the early 1970s is this idea that they were built as a network. And while that idea seems is, is a little bit up in the air right now because a lot of these features haven't been verified on the ground, um, we do know that there's, there's a, at least a handful of regional scale roads that appear to converge on Chaco Canyon. So whether it was a network or not, um, it has informed interpretations about regional exchange across the San Juan Basin, which is uh, kind of the physiographic depression that best characterizes most of uh, Chaco era occupation. Um, so when people saw uh, the network of roads, they began to kind of uh, make some assumptions or began to try to hypothesize what the roads were used for, right? Um, they talked about um, roads being used as pathways where exotic goods were imported or food was redistributed or maybe um, more common ceramics and material goods were also exchanged. Um, data didn't necessarily seem to support that. Uh, there seems to be a lot of stuff coming into the canyon, not a lot of stuff going out of the canyon. So a bi-directional distribution of goods along roads doesn't necessarily seem to make sense. Um, so following that, and, and with the um, more anthropological insights in archaeology in the later 1990s, archaeologists began to think about roads in a more landscape 
perspective and a more holistic way to talk about maybe the multifaceted uses of chocolate foods. Um, so people like Ruth Van Dyke um, said, began to think a lot about pilgrimage and other archeologists also began to pick up and say that perhaps uh, roads were used as routes for pilgrimage from the outlying or the periphery um, to Chaco Canyon. And other archeologists built on that even more to talk about um, <clears throat> the idea that roads were perhaps a physical manifestation of a specific worldview or cosmology. Um, perhaps roads um, were meant to demonstrate important directionality or even roads acted as a way to draw a person's eye across the road surface towards um, an important geographic feature uh, on the horizon, right? So there's a lot of potential uses for roads, a lot of things that, that we've been hypothesizing about as archeologists. Um, but all of these ideas, all of these assumptions uh, about what they were used for are inherently dependent on what Chaco roads look like, right? So whether there is actually a network is an important component of determining what roads were used for. Um, but also how common were they? How characteristic um, are Chaco roads and how similar are the physical attributes of these features to one another, right? And Gwyn Vivian in the late 90s, uh, brought this point up in a, in, a, in a great paper talking and calling for essentially a standard morphology of Chaco roads to be developed as a means of better substantiating our interpretations about them. And this call is really based on the argument about asking the question, are Chaco roads morphologically similar to what great houses or Chaco style great houses are like architecturally? So what that means really is that, um, you know, Chaco style great houses share a suite of common architectural characteristics. Like they're not, all, uh, many characteristics are not everywhere, but there's a handful of characteristics which are really definitive and, and occur pretty often in a lot of great houses, such as in closed kivas or corn veneer masonry, which I'm sure there's quite a few people who have heard about those things as um, they kind of help define what a Chaco style great house is supposed to look like. Um, so the question would be are Chaco roads the same? in the sense that they're different from other roads, but they also, perhaps there's a physical attributes which are part of the canon that best describes what Chaco roads are. So do they have morphological characteristics which are comparable? Um, are they all the same width? Do they all have the same profile shape? Are they all equally deep um, or built within the adjacent landscape in the same way? So that's part of the question I think uh, we're gonna spend the first half of this talk really grappling with. So is there a definitive type of Chaco road? Um, and how can we answer that question, right? One way to tackle it um, is what I'm going to be talking about today, but other people in the past have, have worked on this problem as well. And we have, there is a good record of some morphological characteristics that have been documented by archeologists in the past. Um, so we have uh, pretty good locational data on a handful of roads, you know, through photo interpretations, through satellite data, through ground truthing. Um, so for roads like the North Road and the South Road, we have a pretty good idea exactly where they are and, and, and where they travel. Um, it also became clear through early photo interpretations that chakra roads are very linear. And I guess what I mean by that essentially is that, you know, if a road is traveling along the landscape and, a, and there's a hill, instead of perhaps traversing around that hill. Um, these regional scale roads tend to go across that hill and were built in such a way that they filled or cut into that hill to, to maintain a relatively linear trajectory across the landscape, um, which is unique, especially over the distance that some of these features cover. Um, we have an idea that some of these roads are especially long, um, you know, on the order of maybe over 50 kilometers, of fully contiguous or continuous um, surface. Um, and we also have a relatively good idea that there's the different classes of roads that fall into different widths. Um, so regional scale roads being relatively, being, being quite wide actually, um, you know, over 10 meters and so on. Um, but we don't have good data for some other characteristics which are important, uh, which would include the depth of these features, uh, the shapes of the profiles and how the surface of the road matches in with um, or relates to the adjacent or surrounding landscape, um, which are all important characteristics for discerning how a road is built, right? So we're gonna be 
focused on those latter three issues. And one way to study them is through the use of LIDAR. Um, and just would like to point out, I'm definitely not the first archeologist to use LIDAR and I'm not the first archeologist to use LIDAR to study Chaco roads. Uh, Rich Friedman, Anna Safer and Rob Weiner had a really cool paper in 2017 that I think was the first demonstration of the use of LIDAR for Chaco roads. Um, and hopefully this is just building on that research a little bit. Um, but for those of you who don't know what LIDAR is, I'm going to take a minute just to spell out what this technology does and why it's useful um, and why it's become such a groundbreaking, I think, te uh, technological development for archaeology. Um, LIDAR essentially is an active sensing technology. So what that really means is there's a sensor um, that shoots out laser beams or laser pulses that can be attached, say, to a terrestrial station or to the underside of um, a UAS, a UAB, or larger sensors that can be attached to planes. Um, and what you, what the sensor does is it sends out millions of pulses um, and it times the return of those pulses. Um, and through that, it's gathering data that are both lat long, also elevation or Z values. It's also gathering um, color values or it can get returns on a lot of other different things depending on the sensor. But what it provides us essentially is a point cloud. So it's a three-dimensional, digital reconstruction of the landscape, and not just the landscape, but also foliage, underbrush, um, that sort of thing. And what's really helpful is that since it's essentially not a continuous three-dimensional surface, we can begin to filter out some of this data really easily. Uh, so you can get rid of canopies, you can get rid of underbrush vegetation, and get a perspective of what the bare earth looks like without anything sitting on top of it. Um, and what you get usually when you filter all that out is you get a surface model, elevation model, or terrain model. People, you know, there's a lot of different terms, but generally a surface model, right, would be a raster representation or a gridded representation of the bare earth. And that's useful because essentially what it allows us to do is to digitally look at a landscape in three dimensions, um, you know, which is the way that we deal with the landscapes in space, right? It's in three dimensions and not two dimensions. Um, and that can be particularly helpful when you have features that you want to examine. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to, someone's calling off the phone. We have a landline and no one ever calls it. So it had to be today right now, <laughs> so sorry for that. Um, so these three, mod these three dimensional models, they're really useful essentially for studying ephemeral features uh, like Chaco roads, because what you can do is you can manipulate the surface such that you're casting light or shadows across the surface um, to, to tease out or to better visualize features like roads. I'll give you another view of that. So this would be an elevation model um, that is having different lights cast on it. And you can see that road appear or disappear depending on when the light shows up. Another thing though that you can do, I think which is becoming a more popular uh, process in archeology span is taking an elevation model or a surface model and extracting raw data from it essentially. So on the top left of your screen, what you can see essentially is um, a, a uh, small section of an elevation model. And across it, I've created transect lines at half meter intervals. And then what you can do is you can automate extracting the data from those transects, and then you can normalize it and plot this data graphically to give you an idea essentially of what features look like from the profile view um, without ever actually engaging with that landscape, which is not necessarily great practice, but uh, certainly at times when there's global pandemic um, can be useful. Uh, way to employ your time <laughs> in archaeology. But if you run this process reiteratively, essentially if you repeat it across an entire feature like a road, what you can also do is begin to quantify and also uh, visualize some common attributes of certain features. Um, and you can also begin to look at variability across that feature. Um, so I pretty much built this analysis and ran it um, for a huge sample of Chaco roads to begin to answer the question of what are the most common characteristics from a profile view that define Chaco roads. Um, and here are all the roads that we sampled. And I sampled this using LIDAR data. Um, 
and this is a shout out to Paul Reed in Archaeology Southwest, um, who helped me, uh, um, allowed me to, to use some of this data as well. And I know others like Ruth Van Dyke have been um, really helpful in getting this as well. So thank you to both of those groups. Um, but here are the 10 roads that I sampled. Um, and here are the sections of those 10 roads that were sampled through laying down a bunch of consecutive transects, extracting the data, and then trying to plot it and, and play around with that data a bit. So cumulatively, um, the data set that I'll be talking about today samples about 50 kilometers of Chaco roads um, through over 96,000 transects. Um, and I've broken this data set, at least for the beginning of us sorting out these results, into probable and possible road segments. Um, so the probable road segments um, fall into roads that have been verified on the ground and through interpretation. Um, and then also other roads that have been not consistently verified on the ground, but have been, um, are in close association with other charcoal or occupation or sites um, and have also been identified or talked about by multiple researchers. So there's a greater degree of confidence that those are um, legitimate uh, chocolate features, and then also possible segments, which have simply been um, harder to find good locational information on, um, haven't been ground verified, and, and still am not certain if they're legitimate features or not. Uh, it's likely, but um, there's a slight difference in those classes. So looking at this data, um, just in kind of the average view, first what I did was I took all of the probable sections, all the possible sections, and just calculated the average values that were extracted um, from the elevation model through these transect lines. And what we get through probable segments, I think is a relatively good visualization that fits our expectations of what a chakra road is supposed to look like, right? It's a relatively shallow depression um, that is wide on the order of 20 meters um, and appears to have at least some sort of pos positive topographic feature on both sides. Essentially, that would be a berm. Um, which would likely be a result of, say, people clearing the road surface and taking all of the rubble or whatever was on the road surface and pushing it to the sides and creating a matted burn as so. Uh, this also fits in uh, with the findings of other folks, uh, Rich Friedman and all who did uh, uh, found a similar depth in a part of the North Road that they developed a profile for, and then also a bunch of other people who have had um, um, certainly more work than myself looking at these features on the ground um, and studying them I have found that um, these regional scale features are certainly very wide and um, can often um, be close to 20 meters in width. Um, but beyond, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but possible roads don't necessarily fit this description as well, right? Um, what we see with the possible, the average view of the possible um, road segments is not only that they're laid within a landscape that has generally uh, uh, more elevation change, but also the profile or the surface isn't as well defined, and there doesn't appear to be as um, consistent um, berming or bounding on both sides. So to, to, to get a little bit more nuance about these features, what I thought I would do was then plot everything on a road by road basis to look at um, more specific characteristics that might define some of these features. Uh, so here would be an example of all 23,000 transects that were sampled for the North Road, right? Um, and it's a messy plot. It doesn't really give us a lot of information, right? All of the white lines being individual transect, the red line being um, an average transect uh, that's computed from all of the white lines. And there's no real characteristics that we can discern that are useful. Um, but what it does tell us, and what is, is that we should acknowledge would be this idea that uh, roads vary considerably across their surface, which you can you know, see from an aerial perspective, um, that you have a better degree idea of the degree of variability um, through this type of analysis. Um, what it also says is that we have to filter this data somehow um, to make it meaningful and to use it uh, to some degree, right? Um, so how I chose to filter it uh, was first uh, making sure that I was only going to be dealing with transects that were uh, representative of most uh, visually distinct portions of the road surface. So like on the left, where you see the North Road segment from an aerial view, you know, two or three of those sections being more visible 
other sections being not making sure transects were just over the most visible segments. Um, and then I also quantitatively filtered an automated filtering process that took out transects that were more than a standard deviation beyond um, the average from the entire sample per road. And what we get when this process is completed um, is a slightly better idea, I would say, about the common characteristics across certain roads. Um, and these common characteristics aren't common for all of the roads, which is important, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but for six of the roads, uh, we have relative similarity in the profiles. So they're all shallow depressions. Um, they range between you know, five to 10 centimeters and 35 to 40 centimeters. Uh, they range in width from 10 to 25 meters, although in general, it's on the, uh, about 20 meters wide. And, and the profile though, I think the shapes are, are relatively similar. They're parabolic in shape, they're semi-symmetrical. Um, they consistently are bounded, um, I think by a berm on, on by at least one side. Um, and another important aspect I think is that the landscape that these roads are set within is relatively flat or homogeneous. Um, so for these 50 meter long transects, there's usually um, only about a meter of elevation change across that entire surface, right? Which is um, a pretty consistent uh, landscape to be set with it. But those characteristics don't define all of Chaco roads. Four of the roads um, after filtering don't appear to be roads at all. Um, so there's certainly some investigation that needs to go on further with that. Um, but what we can say uh, from that outcome is that not all Chaco roads are built the same foremost. And, and second, um, that perhaps then Chaco roads uh, were intended to be built differently, perhaps. Um, and if so, maybe used differently. And that's something that I'll get into in a minute. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about some things that we can learn um, from the common shapes of this really definitive class of Chaco roads. The Chaco roads project, which was probably the largest uh, single effort to study Chaco roads in the past, um, spell out, spelt out a really, um, a really good methodology for studying roads in general and studying roads from a profile view. And they made the argument uh, that parabolic or U-shaped um, symmetrical depressions is evidence that erosion was common or consistent or uniform across the entirety of that feature. Um, I'm not sure that actually um, is what's going on or is a, is a good reason or is the, um, is the cause of the commonality that we see in these roads. So let's take the North Road and the South Road as an example. Um, so the North Road, South Road, again, side by side view, I think they look relatively similar, although the South Road is slightly more defined um, or, or generally deeper than the, than the North Road. But if we look at the space that these roads occupy, um, you know, the North Road being on a different half of the San Juan Basin than the South Road, and they're also crossed by different washes. Right, and this being the case, it seems unlikely to me that hydrology, uh, wind, or other erosional forces would be common, if or uniform across the entire the entirety of these features, let alone between the features. Um, so rather, I'd come to the conclusion that the common shape of the North Road and the South Road um, is maybe a better indication that they were built similar similarly, or they were built by people who used common construction techniques or shared a common style of building roads. Um, and that, again, if we take that to be a good conclusion, would suggest um, that people building certain types of Chaco roads were pursuing a very formalized, definitive style of road and creating specific features, right? So there was a canon, there is a specifically Chaco and type of road. Um, that, that might be characterized through the work that I've, I've done here. So I think we can use that definition of a common type of feature um, in ways other than talking about Chaco, which I'll get to in a bit, um, by also assessing if features located outside of the Chaco world or located on the periphery of the Chaco world or in other parts of the Southwest were Chacoan or were not Chaco. Um, so to kind of demonstrate that, I will just take a brief case study into 
uh, a portion of my uh, dissertation research. Um, so Farview Community is located kind of in the middle of the Mesa Verde Uplift in Southwest Colorado. Um, it's located on Chapin Mesa. It was a, um, a primarily a P2, but a, a long inhabited Mesa top community. Um, and right in the center of this community, uh, there is a linear earthen depression uh, that's been interpreted both as a canal or a ditch and also as a road. Um, so I thought this would be a good opportunity um, to, to test its similarity to, to the Chaco feature um, or the Chaco styles of roads. So if we look at the Farview Road um, in comparison to the uh, definitive roads like the North Road, um, from the aerial view, they look relatively similar in width, in linearity, in general ephemerality of the depression itself. From a profile view, it's a little more complicated actually to say the Farby Road simply because it's the, the portion that we sampled is set on the edge of Chapin Mesa, right? So it's as the Mesa is rolling off into the canyon essentially. Um, so we have a lot more um, elevation variability or topographic variability. Um, along a profile. So you kind of have to zoom in, you have to play around with the data a bit, but when you zoom in um, on the Farby feature, which is what you see at the bottom of your screen, um, you get a profile which looks relatively similar to certain roads uh, that I would have classified as the most definitive um, type of Chaco road, right? Um, similar in width, similar in depth, and perhaps even deeper um, uh, in the Farby case than in, in the North Road case. Um, but while from the air and from a profile view, the far view feature looks very similar to the most definitive Chaco roads, uh, there's a key difference, and that's essentially in how this road was built within the landscape. Um, so as I said before, Chaco roads are particularly linear, um, and they seem to travel um, without much attention um, or, or not wanting to deal with topography, um, so they engineer around that, right? This doesn't seem to be the case for this feature in the far view. Um, this, if you look at the proposed length of the entire feature across Chapin Mesa, it follows the general topography of the Mesa very well. So it's not attempting to be fully linear for the continuity of its trajectory. And instead, it's willing to follow, uh, or was it built with a willingness to follow the local, local topography. Um, so what all of this suggests to me is that if you have a road which is built probably in a similar way to Chaco style roads, um, in terms of how it was built into the landscape, in terms of the profile, how it was dug out, or how um, it may have been cleared as a pathway, with the difference of how it was built non-linearly, suggests to me, uh, perhaps, that this is a local emulation of a formal style, right? So that perhaps people living in Farview community were trying to emulate a style of Chaco Road, which they not only knew about, but knew how to replicate to a certain degree, and perhaps chose not to replicate all of those things. Um, so this more complex, I think, understanding of Chaco roads um, and their morphology kind of equips us uh, with uh, more tools to discuss what these roads might mean in other communities, um, such as Farview. What it also allows us to do, and what I'm going to kind of move beyond morphology now for, is that an understanding that not all Chaco roads are built the same. Even if there's a definitive class, they don't all seem to be classified as such or qualified as such. Um, that implies, at least, that roads were used differently. Um, or they serve perhaps a myriad of functions across time and space. Um, and, and perhaps there's even competing uses of roads. Um, so to talk about uh, one potential use of some of the most definitive Chaco roads, I want to talk specifically about the use of timbers in Chaco Canyon um, and how they were transported to Chaco Canyon, say from uh, more distant resource procurement locations. Um, so we, there's a growing body of evidence that's and, and research which is talking about the use of timbers in gray houses in Chaco Canyon. Um, and what this evidence is beginning to say is essentially, um, not only is there a huge amount of beams that are, were used to build monumental gray houses in Chaco Canyon, um, but a significant, or at least a, a, a not insignificant amount of these beams were taken or transported from vast distances away. Um, so through isotopic studies or looking at species of high elevation timbers or timbers that only grew at high elevation, um, it's, it's, it seems to be that 
there are proportions of the entire group of Chaco timbers, which were brought in from places like the Chusca Mountains, the Zuni Mountains, and then even as far as away, as far away as the San Juan Mountains. Um, some people, and this has been actually discussed about for quite some time before, you know, isotopic studies could really verify some of this work, um, but people have been suggesting uh, for quite some time that timbers were carried or rolled along roads to Chaco Canyon. Um, I'm of the opinion that roads were carried, or that, sorry, timbers were carried rather than rolled, uh, mainly because it seems that um, roads were treated very well when they were placed in construction, they were carved, uh, they were placed with offerings. Um, so I'm not sure why people would choose to roll and potentially damage a resource that they um, is, is not only central to their building efforts, um, but also required a huge amount of labor to pick up. Um, so you might want to carry them to their final destination and ensure uh, that they would arrive there uh, with enough structural integrity to be useful in what you're hoping to use them for. Um, so to, to get a better idea about how that practice of moving timbers might have changed across time, uh, we need a better idea about the total number of beams that were brought in, when they were brought in, and also where they were used to some degree. So I used a tree ring database that's at the Chaco Research Archive. And if you're interested in Chaco archeology, span um, I would recommend looking this up. Um, just type in Chaco Research Archive uh, to Google. Um, and thank very Carrie Heitman for a lot of her work <laughs> in putting all this stuff together. Um, but so I used the database from Chaco Research Archive and essentially looked at the ratio of tree species that only grew at high altitudes um, and calculated that proportion to all of the trees in the entire database um, and then applied that ratio to the total number of beams that were used in Chaco Canyon. So of the nearly quarter million beams used, I'm estimating that something on the order of 60,000 of them were imported um, from high altitude forests at the edge of the Chaco world. And if we look at this, if we, we can also use that data to get, to get an understanding of when those beams were cut and therefore within a couple of years of when they might have been used. Um, and what we see here is over 100 years of annual or biannual um, high altitude timber import, uh, beginning sometime in the early 10 hundreds um, and ending in the early 11 hundreds. Um, and so this 100 year period of use implies at least to some degree that there were social mechanisms which allowed this practice to continue across generations, number one. Um, and number two, what it also implies um, is it begins to imply high degrees of planning um, and cooperation, right? Um, Timber, especially when it's fresh cut, can be very, very heavy. So it's likely that they may have traveled uh, to these places to cut timbers, timbers down and then may have stashed them or let them cure for a certain period of time to allow the moisture content to de decrease. Um, and, and this idea that this is a practice that had a huge amount of, of planning going into it is also informed um, when we look at different tree ages. Uh, so if we compare the high altitude species um, with lower or non-high altitude species in this database, what we see essentially across time is that high altitude species um, are more uniform in age than their counterparts. And so what this implies, right, is that, you know, if trees are more uniform in age, then the people who were cutting those trees uh, were looking for more uniform dimensions in those timbers. So they were looking for either uniform width or length, um, more so than perhaps trees that weren't taken from high altitude forests. Um, and this is a huge amount, um, this is a huge amount of planning, but it's also probably to procure these resources an incredible amount of labor, right? So those things go hand in hand. In a way that we can begin to assess or assess the labor that went into this practice, uh, is by looking at the number of altitude beams that we're estimating came into the canyon on a yearly basis. Um, so if we, um, looking at this chart here, you know, you see that essentially by 1030, we're looking at thousands of beams, at least until 1050. Um, on a nearly annual basis, thousands of beams being imported to Chaco Canyon from high altitude forests. 
um, and through at least early 1100, you know, at, at least 200, if not 500 beams on a yearly basis for the rest of that period uh, until the, the spike at 1100 as well. Um, so we can use those numbers to, to kind of recreate or simulate to some degree uh, the amount of times that people would have had to walk back and forth to procure these timbers. Um, so I've written this couple of silly little equations, um, which may or may not stand up. Um, and they're all founded essentially on the amount of timbers that I've estimated in this past graph um, that were imported on a yearly basis. So I'm assuming essentially that to carry the biggest timbers, which were over five meters long, um, it might require a team of 12 people. And essentially this would leave one meter of spacing between pairs, uh, between the person walking in front of you and behind you, uh, so that you're not tripping or stumbling over each other. Um, but if we have 12 people each walking in teams of two, um, they might all be carrying a smaller beam or a straddling pole across their shoulders. And atop that would be the primary beam, right? So the five, the, the massive, or the most massive beams would be laid across these poles that then people are carrying um, in conjunction with one another. And so you can uh, assume, right, that if say 70 beams were being carried um, in a certain year, uh, then you can just pop that in the equation here and say that if the people are planning really well, actually all seven of the beams that this group of 12 is carrying could be used in the final construction project. Right, you could have the primary beam on top and then using the six other beams as well for construction. Um, so if there's 70 beams in a year, um, that would be essentially one trip um, by this full group, or 10 trips, I'm sorry, by this full group back and forth. And that would hold up depending on where the laborers resided, which is an important um, and aspect of this, uh, which I'm sure could use a, a bit more thought. But if the laborers lived in Chocolate Canyon, um, they would have to walk to the periphery to pick up the beam and then return. If they lived at the periphery, they would have to walk to Jaco Canyon and back, right? Um, so 12 people traveling really means 24 individual person trips. And so on a yearly basis, if the 70 beam, high altitude beams were used that year, uh, you're looking at 240 trips, right? Another important aspect though, beyond carrying the beams is cutting them down. Um, and this could also, so this to me would require extra trips, um, if, especially if there was some seasonality to this practice where maybe uh, beams were cut at a specific time of year and allowed to dry and then carried at a different time of year. Um, so if people who were, if the people who were cutting the beams lived in Chaco Canyon, you'd have to recreate perhaps uh, or re-estimate the number of trips differently than if they lived at the periphery. So if we think about timber cutters or people cutting timbers um, living in or near Chaco Canyon, um, then the amount of trips taken every year would essentially be a function of the number of beams cut um, and the amount of days a laborer would spend cutting beams and how many beams they would cut per day. So if you're assuming that people are able to cut through say five beams a day and they spend um, you know, 25 days or 10 days um, cutting beams, then they would cut 50 beams per person Per, per year. Um, and again, this would then you'd have one trip going to the periphery and then another trip returning back to Chaco Canyon. Alternatively, if people lived at the periphery um, or if laborers, the people cutting beams lived at the periphery, then you may not need much more than two single trips in a year. And that trip would essentially be um, by maybe someone living in the canyon or someone going out to the periphery to communicate their needs and then return it back. So using these series of calculations um, and uh, essentially um, that are all based on the reconstructions or the estimations I've made regarding the amount of people or the amount of timbers that were imported yearly, what we see is um, by the end of 1100 when high altitude timber import tends to slow down and stop, cumulatively over 200,000 individual person trips just to acquire these beams, right? Which is an incredible amount of labor if you're just thinking about 200,000 times um, people having to go back and forth to, to, um, to facilitate this need. 
But you, what you can also think about then is the amount of distance they walked. Um, so rather than doing a, um, applying some more complicated models, I thought I'd, I'd just apply a flat value um, for the purposes of this talk here. If we think about um, walking timbers from the Chuska Mountains, which are located west of Chaco Canyon, into Chaco Canyon, um, that uh, straight line is about 75 kilometers. Um, but if you're of the opinion that I am, that perhaps people used roads as the means of transporting timbers, um, then the distance is probably far above that, right? That individuals perhaps went up into the mountains, got the beams, and then transported them to, at, to the beginning of the road or the community that was located close to the beginning of the road, and then walked that entire surface or walked that entire route to Chaco Canyon. And so if that's the case, we're looking at each trip being on the order of over 100 kilometers. So if you apply that to the cumulative number of person trips, we're looking at tens of millions of kilometers being walked just to procure timbers for construction projects in Chaco Canyon, which is you know, an astronomical number. And to put that in some context, um, to acquire the timbers that were used between 10 or high altitude timbers that were used between 1035 and 1107. If only, if a person only participated in one part of this practice once a year, meaning that you only went to go cut timbers or you only carried, um, you know, one primary beam through one trip once a year, you would need 30, 13,000 individuals on average every year just to um, import the amount of timbers that were used, right? Which is a huge proportion of the population, or as well, it's a significant portion, um, depending on what your estimates of the regional population are, right? So there was an incredible amount of labor and a high proportion probably of the people living around this area at the time uh, were contributing to this. And what that would indicate to me has indicated to other people in the past who have talked about labor, um, central authorities, and hierarchy at Chaco Canyon, at least this demonstrates or suggests to me, right, um, that the act of importing timbers along roadways was a highly coordinated and managed practice, um, perhaps by some central group or authority or perhaps an elite group that, elite group that was living within Chaco Canyon. Um, however, I think it's important probably not to overstate perhaps the coercive capacities of the central group um, or what they might have required people to do, um, right? It's, I would also expect for this many people likely participating in this, in this practice um, that the laborers, the timber porters, um, whatever you wanna to refer to them as, um, the people were agreeing to participate to some degree, right? So they were acquiescing to participating in, in this behavior and in this need for these timbers. Um, and perhaps it allowed them to do certain things you know, maybe it gained them access to social, economic, or religious relationships and networks, right? If we think about timber importation, say, along the road, perhaps what happened was a group transported timber from their community to the nearest community down the road, and then they let, dropped that timber off and returned back. And then this community transported it to the next, right? So there's an engagement um, that may not have happened otherwise, or this ability or capacity to interact with other communities and other people um, through this practice. And it's that level of engagement probably um, that probably occurred that leads me to believe that perhaps this um, act of carrying timbers became far more than just an act of resource procurement and became a practice that was um, imbued with greater importance such as pilgrimage. And here's a shout out for Ruth Van Dyke who has done a lot of thinking about pilgrimages. Um, and I'm sure I could say much of this stuff better than I. Um, but if it was, if timber importation became an act of pilgrimage, I don't think it emerged that way or it began in such a way, right? It likely came out of this need for resources um, which allowed people to build relationships among communities and among and across uh, the Chaco world, which then began to have greater social, religious, or ritual importance. And the importance of that practice continued on to allow people to, to, to buy in and want to contribute more, uh, which then allowed them to build more relationships and so on. And so it was a system, or at least a, 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 
uh, stepwise notion of relationships that built on itself. Um, and so that's part of what I want to leave you with today, right? Is that the study of Chaco roads allows us to talk about networks in a certain way, which talk about uses of those roads, which then talk, allow us to talk about relationships, right? And so if there's a formal class of Chaco road, then maybe formal practices occur upon them. And one such formal practice could be timber importation as an act of pilgrimage to Chaco Canyon. Um, and I think it fits well in these broader definitions or understandings we have about pilgrimage, which is essentially an arduous journey that allows pilgrims to relate to one another through some common experience. And you know, it's hard for me to imagine um, that there could be that carrying a timber you know, 100 kilometers across the San Juan Basin would be anything other than an arduous journey uh, that you would want to do to relate to other people to some degree. Um, so there we are at about the 45 or 46 minute mark. Um, and I'm, that's about where um, all I have to say. I'd like to thank a ton of people who have helped me think through these things. Um, I'd like to thank the folks at Mesa Verde National Park, at the Grand Canyon, um, aviation crew, Paul Reed with Archaeology Southwest, um, my committee, tons of other archaeologists who have helped me think through these things. Um, and here are some references. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, that was an incredibly clear presentation of some really technically, um, you know, sophisticated research. So great job on the presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, we have a lot of questions um, and I'm just gonna begin at the top and uh, keep going. Um, how, the first question is, I'm not sure you can answer this. How many total verified roads have been found mm -hmm. and how many sites do they connect with? Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there are a greater number of local scale roads that are associated with Chocolera communities. Um, so much of what I talked about in this presentation was regional scale features. Um, so I guess I will speak from, from that context. You know, of regional scale features, I would say we're looking at um, no more than three or four which have been verified and we seem really confident in their continuity across you know more than 25 kilometers right um but there are probably um you know most estimates most maps seem to depict somewhere between 10 to 12 roads that kind of uh converge on chaco canyon and that were regional in scale um, and so again, I would say that probably no more than 50% and probably closer to 35% of those um, people would all, if you asked anyone, they would all relatively agree. Um, these roads uh, were legitimate regional scale features that were built to be regional in scale and connect a bunch of communities. Um, of those roads which have been verified, um, you know, we're, we're looking at dozens of great house communities that are, are physically linked or are in very close proximity to those roads. So within one or two kilometers. Um, so most Chacoera um, great house communities um, that show up um, in a lot of archeological research actually weren't directly affiliated with a regional scale road, um, but some big and important communities were. Um, however, if we're talking about local scale roads, um, you know, there are many great house era communities which have smaller roads or earthen depressions or earthworks or monumental earthworks, uh, whatever people refer to them as, directly associated with those communities. So I would say more communities are associated with a small local road, um, less communities associated with a large regional road that perhaps was intentionally built to connect with Chaco Canyon itself. Um, so yeah, with the, um, the Farview Road that you discussed, that would be an example of a local road? Yeah, I would put that in the definition of a local road, right? It's probably longer than most other local roads. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's traveling for like seven or eight kilometers. Um, and an important part about 
um, you know, these roads is that a lot of people are beginning to think that, um, you know, the, the word time bridge has been brought up, right? Is that they link sites uh, that were inhabited in the past and places they were, um, might be currently inhabited, right? So this far view feature, um, you know, uh, goes down towards um, cliff dwellings that were inhabited once people had left Farview community itself. Um, so it's possible this feature began as a small local segment tied into the community. And as people moved um, off the Mesa, they built the road as a, some sort of connection with their past and with that place. Um, but I would classify the Farview road as more of a local emulation, a, a local style road, not, not intended to be built or connected with Chaco Canyon. Yeah, very interesting. And a shout out to uh, John Stein and Andrew yep. Fowler for yeah. um, discussing that time bridge concept. You mm -hmm. answered this sort of in your talk, but I think it's worth reiterating. Uh, why so much variation in the roads? Mm -hmm. uh, were they made at different times or what explains that variation? Yeah, um, a portion of that variation is uh, landscape use, right? You know, they're probably a thousand years old. Um, uh, a lot's happened on them, um, you know, and it's possible a lot of these roads were, roads were used in historic times um, by people, you know, uh, so there could just be variability in land use across time, which has significantly impacted these features, right? And, and that's a good case um, for, for this type of work is that it's probably the best sort of record we're going to have of these features as they continue to deteriorate through time. Um, I would expect, though, some of that variability has to do with differences in the way they were used in the past and also differences um, in the time um, or the period that they were constructed with it. Uh, and people with greater, um, you know, folks like Rob, um, who are doing more ground survey or focusing on the ceramics associated with the site can answer this question better than I and begin to talk about the temporality um, and the data assignments of these features. But I would also, I would, I would expect, yes, that um, some of this variability is because segments of the road were used at different periods of time um, or were more popular at different periods of time, like perhaps, you know, roads around Pueblo Alto. Um, you know, you might have some variability in the North Road where it's closer to communities because it may have just received more use um, closer to where people lived, whereas the spaces that are really distant from communities may not be as a, of a profound depression simply because um, less foot traffic. And do you think of these as uh, the whole system of roads that have been documented as consisting of primary roads, secondary roads, even more minor roads? And have people been able to even distinguish footpaths uh, in the archeological record of the Southwest? Um, yeah, people have talked about all of those things uh, quite a bit. I think a classification system is certainly warranted um, for, for typing and, and, and kind of putting some order to these features. So yeah, I think there is definitely a primary class. Um, well, there certainly needs to be a, a scalar class that talks about the spatial reality of these features, right? So there should be a regional class of road, a, a local class of road that they're classified simply by um, the length of the feature itself. And then perhaps within the regional roads themselves, we also need to talk about classes, right? A very formal type of regional road, um, a less formal type of regional road, or even a, a smaller or smaller class of regional road. Um, footpaths have certainly been identified, um, you know, single use, Foot traffic is best evidence probably in stairways and stuff like that, which you'll see in the Southwest um, that are carved into the side of stone simply because they just preserve longer. Um, but there's no doubt that um, ancestral public people and ancestral people living in the Southwest um, had a myriad of footpaths and trails that they were using a lot of the time. Um, what allows us to differentiate those things, say, from Chaco Roads is, is largely with the width and the depth of the Chaco Road features themselves. Um, you know, most footpaths you're, are gonna be less than a meter wide or something like that. Very common to like hiking trails and stuff like that. Um, they won't be this hyper formalized, uh, nearly monumental landscape feature. We thought we recognized a network of footpaths in the Goodman Point 
community center. So oh, maybe, wow. we can, maybe we can go out there and look at those if we can get permission to look at them. Uh, oh, that would be, that would be really awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, what is the evidence for settlements, permanent or seasonal, in the mountains uh, where they were procuring timbers? Uh, and could there have been a group of people who cut and prepared the timbers on site and then a second group who transported them? Hmm. That's a really good point. Um, there's very little evidence, um, right? So, so most of our, you know, our highest resolution um, data on where these timbers were acquired from come from isotopic studies. And, and isotopes are regionalized uh, or at least specific to a really a relatively regional ecology. Um, so that makes it really hard for us to have precise understandings of where these types of beams would come from. Um, so when I've tried to you know, model this movement through least cost analysis and stuff like that, or through movement models or network models, uh, I generally have to create random points uh, within the elevation range that these timbers grew in a specific mountain range. So it's entirely possible um, yes, that there was a group that they were kind of working at the same time, a group going up into the forest and cutting and, and a group transporting those beams perhaps to a, a place where they were stored or maybe a community at the, the start of one of these roads. Um, but the evidence for that um, uh, is few and far between. Um, and there's, there's no evidence that I know of for ancestral Pueblo camps or like lumber camps in in any of these ranges, although I could be wrong. So I think, um, I forget the exact percentage, I think it was 24% that come from high altitude. This yeah. is my question. This isn't one that somebody wrote in. I probably shouldn't be allowed to ask questions. Uh, do you think that they were procured because of their symbolic value or because they met certain architectural requirements? Yeah, I think probably a bit of both. Um, it's hard to not, maybe that's not the way to phrase it, um, but oftentimes when we do things that require a lot of work, uh, symbolism and tradition become important um, aspects of that. So, so in the question or in answering that question that it was probably a bit of both, like there was some symbolic value um, of carrying these timbers or having timbers from these different places um, and also practical reasons. Um, it would be hard to know which started first necessarily. Yeah. Right. Um, but I would expect that it's a bit of both. And it, and it could be the fact that, um, you know, when humans build things, we spend a lot of time. Uh, when we contribute to building things, we spend a lot of time thinking and making sure that um, that symbols and traditions are well communicated. Right. A lot of the masonry of Charco Canyon that was covered up in plaster. So why would you pay that much attention to chinking stones or to masonry if it's going to be covered up as well? Because the process and symbolism, the tradition, um, all of that is really important. And it's deeply embedded in our practices of um, building and creating spaces and that sort of thing. So I'd expect for the use of timbers, it's the same thing. Um, highly symbolic, um, but also a, a, a taking maybe a symbolic practice, practice and making sure that you did it in a practical way. So that if you were gonna spend all that time, you're at least getting the best tempers to the ones that you really want, um, you know, for structural reasons. Well, I know those um, high altitude trees have high symbolic value in modern Pueblos. And it strikes right. me that that would be a good topic to talk to Pueblo people about. Oh yeah, and that would be incredible. And that's something that, you know, is certainly lacking in this presentation in this discussion I've had, um, part of that because of um, COVID and, and me sitting in a house <laughs> by myself doing yeah, this. Right. Um, but it's certain that that's something that would be of great value that I'd love to talk to people about, I think is um, an important and missing aspect of this. Great. Well, um, this is a great question from a geologist with an understanding of Chaco, and I hope I can do it mm -hmm. uh, justice because she asks, kind of embeds several questions in one, but this confidence level that we have in the road based on it retaining its morphology, um, how much do you think that was a result of maintenance happening because of the political importance of the road or the needs to have that road 
to efficiently transport timbers. And I apologize to this person if I didn't ask their question right, but. Yeah, no, I, that, that's, it's a, that's a complicated question uh, depending on the way that you're uh, tackling it or the way you're trying to consider it with analyses. Um, you know, I ran a series of models to look at if they were actually the most efficient pathway from the Chuskas or from the Zunis to Chaco Canaan. Um, and it depends on how you consider energy or time being reduced along these pathways. You know, so even if we, um, you know, you reduce the energetic or time costs of walking along the road by say 5%, these models tend to divert all the traffic to the road. So it's my guess that just having a prepared surface, even one that's minimally prepared like Chaco roads, you know, which generally didn't have, you know, they weren't engineered and that they had a clay base and, and, and stone pavement. Uh, it was really packed earth or cleared earth. Um, that seems to have been enough to, to be a conductive surface that saved energy and time of walking across it. Um, and things that roads also do other than actually saving our energetics is they give us a path to walk visually, right? So if you're walking on a hiking trail, um, you know where you're going and you know where you're supposed to go, which is important and it saves time and energy. Um, whereas if you're walking up you know, a mountainside and you have no idea where you're going, you spend a lot more time trying to question the pathway. So it's also that simply having a road laid out in front of you is really helpful, um, especially when maybe there's 12 of you um, trying to cooperatively walk in a specific way. Um, and in terms of the surface being, or the, the conformity of these features being a result perhaps of continuous use across time, um, you know, that's a natural conclusion that I've also come to, I think, is that, you know, these roads being not necessarily deep, um, probably the maintenance, of, the maintenance of these features and the things that allowed them to remain uniform was a consistent uh, maintenance and, and clearing of the roadway surface across time. Um, so maybe that the, the ground became more compacted just as more people used it or people cleared it off. Um, um, but that was probably a reiterative process across time uh, because they certainly weren't constructed like you know Roman roads, which there require different layers of of stone and rock, um, and and were highly constructed in that sense. Um, these appear to be more continuous use, um, but in a formal way of continuous use. Um, the labor requirements that you calculated for transporting the timbers were fascinating to me. And it, I think it's really valuable because it puts such a human dimension on right. the scale. You know, I Thank knew you. it was a lot, but I never thought it was that much. Um, have there been similar efforts to estimate the labor involved in constructing the roads themselves? And I would say in this regards that the ones that we've cross-sectioned up here with an archaeological trench, the bottom of the road is actually deeper than the current depression because it's oh, really? in some over time. But have there been attempts to quantify labor and actually building <clears throat> the roads? Um, I haven't seen them. Um, you know, there's been some labor. Uh, gosh, you know, and there, there might be some discussion in Chaco Roads Project um, that is, you know, not as familiar in my head as it should be. Um, you know, I went and using these profiles, I tried to estimate, you know, the amount of dirt that would have to be at least moved out of the way to create the road surface. And we're looking at, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of square meters of displaced earth, right? Which if you compare to reconstructions of Cahokia, people moving earth, we're talking um, years and years of people hours. To, to clear that earth. So whether that was a, a scene, so I, I don't know of many, of any more precise reconstructions, um, you know, and if I have some of those reconstructions and I hope to talk about them more in the future. Um, but yeah, my best estimate would be that we're looking at a huge amount of time being put into even just clearing, you know, 35 centimeters of earth, you know, and across 50 kilometers, that's, that's a lot of, of dirt being moved. Um, but it's also possible again that for these regional scale features, um, you know, you might have more official construction efforts closer to the communities, which is what I think the Chocolate Woods Project, project has shown in some of their excavations um, and some of the few excavations that have been done. Um, and in the center of these features, maybe it was a, uh, a less profound effort of kind of 
pushing the earth to the side, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and, and over a process of a hundred years, you know, a couple of people moving some stones as they go can add up to a lot of, a, a lot of earth being moved, even if it wasn't one individual uh, labor effort. Um, yeah. Um, we got the question of whether any of the road segments are paved. Uh, not that I know. Um, the closest thing that there is to pavement um, would be like rocks being stacked at the edge of a road on um, slick rock um, or exposed ground um, bedrock. Um, so not paving the road necessarily as much as making sure that people knew the edge of the road as they were walking on um, places that weren't dirt. Um, but I don't know of any any with any pavement. So you said you don't. There's no um, campsites associated with the harvesting spots for the high altitude timbers. Are there camp spots along the road that they were being transported on? Um, so there's communities. So there's great house communities. There's also shrines, heraduras. Um, whether those were places where people camped, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar enough with that. Um, but there, there are non-residential sites associated with these roads um, that are in between uh, communities or, or residentially occupied sites. Um, and those could have been places where people stopped and rested, recovered, um, or even slept and spent, spent longer periods of time at. So uh, this is a question from our colleague at Santa Clara Pueblo, Porter Swinsel. Uh, hello, mm -hmm. Porter, thanks for tuning in. And I don't know if you wrote this question before, we had a little bit of discussion of this earlier about the symbolic importance of high altitude timbers. And uh, we mentioned that it would be really good to talk to Pueblo people about that. But uh, Porter's question is, did, did you use ethnographic sources to inform your research and analysis? Mm. I, I spent a lot more time looking at ethnographic stuff in terms of pilgrimages, uh, you know, Zuni salt pilgrimages and stuff like that, um, when thinking about the practices of movement. Um, so there's, there's, and, you know, in times where I spent more talking about the pilgrimage itself, yeah, there's a lot of really good ethnographic data um, and support for the idea of cyclical pilgrimages that are tied towards resource procurement, um, that there's this deep enmeshment of um, ritual practice with uh, getting resources and stuff like that. Um, so, and, and, and that is across the American Southwest and across groups, um, both in the Northern and Southern Southwest. Um, but in terms of the yeah, timbers, no, I, I haven't spent as much time I need to become more familiar with that. Well, Porter would certainly be someone to be high on the list of somebody to talk to. So hopefully you all can connect someday. Yeah. Um, is there a is there any evidence of pilgrimages in petroglyphs? Uh, yes, there are petroglyphs that dictate or um, illustrate um, processions, migrations, pilgrimages. So there's support. Um, in rock art across in northern southwest, which um, support ideas of cyclical journeys, um, both longer and shorter distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're astounding. Yeah, and they're yeah they're great. And some of them, you know, they what's really cool about them is um, certain ones they extend for essentially panels and they go around corners, right? So it's you have to. You, you yourself have to walk along these illustrations to really mm -hmm. experience a procession, which is a, is a powerful experience, experience in its own right. Nice. Um, this is a good question. Now your profiles show cuts, especially through uh, topographic highs. Are there also fill sections um, mm -hmm. as we see in the constructed roads of uh, causeways in Mesoamerica? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there's certainly nothing on the scale of causeways in Mesoamerica or South America and parts of Brazil, but um, there are cut and fill sections. Um, so an important aspect of actually developing profiles and studying these roads in the way I've done them is not only having perpendicular transects, but in transect along the entire surface. 
So a single transect that that runs in parallel with the feature. Um, so that's something I'll do in the future. Um, but yes, from that you would see that there are sections where the road is both cut and filled um, to to make you know topography less of an impact across it. That's not for all roads. It's certainly not consistent, um, but it is present. Thank you. Um, so we're 20 minutes into questions. If if you're up for it, I'm going to ask a few more because I'm finding this so interesting. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy get... to keep putting opinions whether they're founded or not. So <laughs> well, they sound good to me. I'm I'm uh, uh, I'll apologize to people I don't get to. But um, a question we got is, are there stairways along the roads? Yes. Um, again, not for all roads. Most of the stairways are found um, in Chaco Canyon that are associated at the ends of these roads. Uh, although there's other points, say at Kutz Canyon, where um, I can't recall if there's a stairway. I believe there is. Um, so it's often at either end of a road that you might find a stairway. Um, you know, and in large portions of the San Juan Basin where these roads cross, uh, there's not the the geology for stairways to exist. It's a really homo a relatively homogeneous flat landscape. Uh, so it's only once you get into places, these canyons where a staircase could even be built. Um, so whether it's by design that staircases are at the end or beginning of the roads or are simply um, a result of the landscape, I'm, I'm unsure. Um, but yes, there are. Sean, what do you make of the um, racetrack or these circular features that surround uh, outliers like at the Holmes group? Yeah, uh, no, those are, those are one uh, good piece of evidence to point to, to say that we need a, a more, a better treatment of roads in terms of developing a classification of them, right? Those to me categorically from a landscape view or from an aerial view are meant to be something entirely different, serve different purposes, either symbolically or utilitarian. Um, but those um, being categorically different from these regional scale roads that I've spent most of this afternoon talking about. Um, you know, I, I am unfamiliar with what these features look like from a profile view. Um, but to me, they seem to be, um, what's really important about them, right, is that they're relatively common, uh, these, these types of roads encircling a community for say, right? So they're common in what they're, they look like from the air and what they're supposed to be doing in terms of how they surround a community, but they never physically connect places. So to me, they might be a better line of evidence uh, for transportable ideas about how we use and build landscapes or how people in the Chaco world built and use landscapes, right? Because with the Chaco road, these regional ones, you know, the road shows up at your doorstep, right? To some degree. And it came from you know another community down the line, and so you have that that full continuity with who you're supposed to relate to. Well, with these um, other roads, which are meant to encircle community, they're not meant to. They're they're meant to be about that community alone. Uh, so there might be more interesting things about um, how those types of road features are transported across space and what that means. Um, in terms of interaction with each other, knowledge about landscape use, or formalizing the landscape when you're building features like roads. So we find, um, it seems like we find more roads in modern landscapes that haven't been impacted by things like modern agriculture. Here in southwestern Colorado, uh, most of the mesa tops have been farmed for the last 120 years. Right. Can LIDAR still identify roads in areas that have been impacted by things like modern farming in Southwest Colorado? Um, I think, yes, it has the capability to, um, but it's in relatively unique cases. Um, most of the roads that you know I've examined through LIDAR and, remotely sensed, and other remotely sensed data, either through drones or through satellites, um, have primarily been impacted through um, grazing and, and ranch activities. Um, so those, you know, the, the practices of ranching, you're not intentionally digging into the ground or tilling up the earth like you are with farming. Um, so you're more likely to see them in the context that I focused on. 
However, in mesa tops where there's been consistent farming, um, you know, there are roads that have been picked up through LIDAR or through uh, other satellite imaging that have been farmed consistently in the modern era. Um, that usually um, depends though on what type of farming is going on, how deep the earth was being redug on a seasonal or yearly basis, um, and also about how the fields of farming overlap uh, the road itself, right? So if there's a perpen if there's a road traveling this way and the tilled roads go this way as opposed to this way, it's going to impact how these technologies allow us to detect those features in the landscape. Um, so, but I would say with that being said, there are probably a huge number of roads which have been relatively erased through modern land practices. You know, and that's just one of the aspects of archaeology is people live today, lived in the past, and you know, we're not the record is which will not always persist. Um, that's just one of the things that happens. Yeah. Um well, Sean, lots of people wrote into the chat saying what a good job you did, including one person who asked if you were Dr. Tom Fields' son and the grandson of Fred Fields in Gunnison County. That's and right. It says yeah, Gunnison yeah. County fame. So I don't know right. uh, why Fred is so famous, but I know you're from there. So I assume that's yes. right. Yep. No, Fred Field is my grandpa. He was county commissioner, which is where he got um, a lot of his uh, no recognition from. And yeah, notoriety. Yes, it was. So yeah, I am from from the, the the lesser son of greater men, as it were. So, so there's a lot of several questions we haven't gotten to. Maybe uh, we can work with Taylor and get those questions to you via email, and uh, you could write some uh, short responses to those people. But I want to close with one question: um, What do you think the most important thing roads tell us about the Chaco polity? Mm. It's kind of putting you on the spot, but yeah, no, that's that's a big picture question. I like it. I appreciate it. Um, hmm. I think maybe not what they tell us precisely as much as what they challenge us to think more about. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think studying roads challenges us to think a lot more about the scale on which interaction, planning, and intentional building of relationships may have occurred. You know, archaeologists, I think, have done a great job of recognizing movement of materials and, and that, you know, as materials move, um, relationships surely follow or relationships form and, and materials follow. Um, roads, I think, push us to think even on, on slightly broader terms and that there was a high degree perhaps of intentionality in the networks that people were forming and the ways that they were trying to um, formalize their relationship with one another. And then whether that's actually what was going on or not, by looking at roads and, and um, you know, it challenges us to think that, um, you know, people were acting, living um, far beyond the scale um, that sometimes we give them uh, credit for in the past. Yeah, I had a professor at ASU, George Kogel, who said that archaeologists tend to underimagine the past. And your, right. your presentation tonight has really helped us imagine this incredible past and Chaco Canyon in new ways. So oh, you did thank a you very really, much. yeah, you did a really great job. Uh, I know I learned a lot. And I want to, we had about 240 folks. Uh, Oh, great. And we still have 124 of yeah. you out there that have hung in with us. So thank you, thank so you all for hanging in and for your support of the Crow Canyon webinar program. And especially thanks to you, Sean, for the research you're doing and for your presentation this afternoon. Yeah, thank you all very much. I appreciate it.